There's this YouTube channel called Spirit Science. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this. Long and long ago, I covered this on my main YouTube channel, Owen Morgan Telltale. I covered this specific video. The, the title is Secrets of the Moon. Now, I don't want to cover this again right now. I might cover it again in the future because it takes a lot of technical debunking. But the claims made in Spirit Science are insane it's primarily run by one guy named jordan something i don't remember his full name yeah he goes by jordan duchnitz i don't know if that's his real name i think his no he goes by jordan david pierce his real name is jordan duchnitz or something i i think anyways he's a conspiracy theorist to the core he believes the moon is hollow he thinks that it was cr a spaceship that was created by blah, 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 all kinds of crazy stuff and he believes that, like, David Icke, the guy that believes that lizard people run the world, he thinks that he's right about a bunch of stuff. It's insane. It's absolutely insane. Well, this guy, Jordan, who runs Spirit Science, he released a video not too long ago on his Spirit Science YouTube channel, October 6, 2023. Title is Mysteries of the Word of God, Christ Series Part 1. Now, he's not really a Christian. He's a New Age nutcase, kind of like Teal Swan, for example. But I wanted to listen to his breakdown because he has some weird views on Christianity. Weird. Anyway, let's give this a listen and uh, see what they have to say here. Oh, by the way, I, one quick thing I wanted to mention about Jordan. There are, are accusations of sexual assault against Jordan. I don't know if they're true or not, so keep that in mind. As you go in search of this, I haven't looked up. I haven't looked into it enough. It's hard to know for sure. Um, but at the very least, he is a scam artist. I don't know how else to put it. He's a scam artist, bare minimum. And while we listen to this, we're gonna play some Breath of the Wild too. Just going around getting Korok seeds and light roots and stuff. Should just be in the background if you never played it. Shouldn't bother you too much. Jesus Christ! Who is he, and why is he such a big deal in the world today? The animation's on point. Jesus might be one of the biggest mysteries. To some people, he is literally the embodiment of the fullness of God. He's not really a mystery. Uh, some people don't believe he existed. I personally think he did. Seems to me the guy was probably just uh, a legend, just overhyped. That's my personal opinion. Doesn't seem like a mystery to me, but okay. And to others, he never existed. The historical evidence of him is also strange, with it both seeming self-evident and non-existent. Well, okay, I'm sorry. I got to break down every word here because this guy has a habit of lying and using word salad and making absolutely no sense whatsoever. So let's break this down word by word. What did he just claim about Jesus? Of him is also strange. With the, the historical evidence of him is also strange, he says. Others, he never existed. The historical evidence of him is also strange with it both seeming self-evident and non-existent. How is it self-evident? I'm sorry, man, this makes no sense. I've got to pull apart every word with these people because they're complete nonsense from top to bottom. Everything this dude says is nonsense. Which is paradoxical to say the least. It, it's nonsensical. You can't have something that's self-evident with no evidence whatsoever, no reason to believe any of it. That's like saying the idea that Muhammad was the the real messenger of God is self-evident. How is anything self-evident for that matter? There's no evidence of any of this stuff. It's garbage, all of it. Isn't it about time that these kinds of questions about Jesus were answered? Especially when it comes to the question of relationship between Jesus Christ and Christ consciousness? For okay, Christ consciousness is this weird kind of religious idea that these people have. By the way, this whole self-evident thing, I don't I don't believe anything is self-evident. You should have proof and evidence of every single thing that you believe, period. Self-evident implies that there's common sense that that appeals to something or that spells something out that, that gives you reason to believe something. It's just common sense, just common sense. There's no such thing as common sense. Everybody's common sense is different from everybody else's. I mean, if I talk to a Muslim and say it's just common sense that Jesus was real and the Son of God and blah, 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 they're going to have a completely different idea of common sense than me, and they're going to say it's not common sense. 
So there's no self-evident. ...of relationship between Jesus Christ and Christ consciousness. For those who have followed spirit science for a time, way back in the beginning, we created the original human history movie and in it discussed the coming of Jesus. His oh yeah, they made a bunch of bizarre claims about Jesus and knowing that he was real and how he was real and blah, blah, blah. Birth, death, and resurrection. We explored the idea that his life was one which created a pathway for us to reach something called Christ consciousness, a state of embodying the divine qualities intrinsic to our being. However, even this idea today must be challenged because the traditional Christian thinking is that Jesus alone is God. Naturally, as you might expect, this conversation is a very sensitive subject, which must be approached with great care since we are- Okay, the idea that um, Jesus was God was added later, long after Jesus came along. The, the Trinity, that wasn't added until long after the fact, um, 70 years after Jesus was around. That's when that idea started forming out. And it was only from certain specific factions. Now, writing from those factions made its way into the Bible in the form of the book of John. But the writer of the book of John didn't know Jesus, knew nothing about the guy, um, never met the guy, and didn't support any of the things that Jesus himself specifically believed. Jesus did not believe that he was the Son of God. So the Trinity is false, and so is the teaching of hellfire. Jehovah's Witnesses got those two specific things right. Nothing else, pretty much, but at least those two things they were right about. Nation is a very sensitive subject, which must be approached with great care, since we are addressing a precious belief system which is a part of many religions today. Truth can be known, but it requires humility and surrender in the face of our own shortcomings in order to see it. Why? Why can truth be known only if you show humility? I don't understand. What does that even mean? Does that, is, is there any meaning to that at all? Can't, isn't it the kind of thing you just like lay it out for me? Tell me what the truth is and give me the evidence and boom, I, so, I suddenly know the truth too now? This is just complete nonsense. We must all be careful here. For when anyone attaches themselves to a position or opinion without allowing for different ideas or perspectives, they limit their understanding. Some of the brightest minds and most successful people in the world are those who can hold multiple paradoxical ideas in their minds at the same time. Dude, what the hell am I even looking at? This is actually a really cool, like, sculpture or whatever it is, but what a bizarre image to drop in here at this moment in the film, okay? And we would all be wise to practice this. Therefore, today we wish to extend an invitation. No matter where you may be coming from, let us together thoroughly discuss the nature of Christ and not stop until we arrive at a higher understanding and a greater truth. Okay, I, I'm going to need evidence. All, I, all I'm asking for is evidence. Just give me evidence of anything that you claim, and boom, I'm a believer just like that. Oh, yeah, and did anybody notice that uh, they made Jesus out to be white in this? Is that weird? Jesus was very obviously Middle Eastern, right? This is a collective journey. And so along this adventure, which will be made in many parts, please share your experiences and wisdom in the comments below. A cheap way to get uh, engagement. Even for us, this series is a learning journey. And so let us each be mindful to carefully weigh all of the information against the metric of our own conscience and belief system. Have your own experience and decide for yourself what makes the most sense to believe in. And before we really jump in, one more disclaimer is needed. Okay, this background is searing my eyes, please. Give your do dark backgrounds. I'm begging you in the future. Why does this guy insist on having a white background? We have a ton of ground to cover here. Over the past 2000 years, the words of Jesus Christ have been explored around the world by billions. And today there are over 45,000 denominations of Christianity globally. And while yeah, I, I don't trust a word out of their mouths, even mundane basic things that seem trivial don't believe any of it okay look everything out. he says the sky is blue double check it how many denominations of christianity 
I can't find anything quickly and easily. It appears as though I'm finding the number 40,000. I, I see where he found the number 45,000, but I don't know if that's even like a reliable source, truthfully. It's hard to tell. Uh, again, just check everything. While so many do their best to uphold the wisdom and teachings of Christ, not all of them agree, and some even seem to go against what Christ taught. Further, there are both orthodox literal interpretations and mystical interpretations surrounding Jesus. And we want to appropriately explore both of these. Certainly, some might be offended that we'd cover one side or the other, but we really want to be respectful to all perspectives and reconcile them against each other. So he's saying he's going to compare different beliefs? And so, this series is going to begin with a more orthodox tone, starting on familiar territory to the story of Jesus. And as we continue to explore, we will break into mystical ground by discussing Gnostic Christianity and other mystical interpretations and seeing if and how these perspectives fit together in order to find the ultimate truth. Uh, okay, I actually know a, a lot about this subject, Gnostic Christianity and stuff. I'd be willing to bet I know a whole lot more about the subject than this guy, Jordan Dukenix or whatever his name is. Something to consider while we get started. It doesn't matter if we believe in a higher power unless we believe that we have access to it. It does not matter if we confess that God has come in the flesh unless we are willing to understand that we are that flesh. I'm sorry, wait, what? What is he saying here? He says it doesn't matter if there is a higher power if we don't have access to that higher power? Are you serious? Yes, it does. What if God created us and then stepped away, just left, led us to our own devices or whatever? I, I would like to know that, right? That matters to me. What are you talking about? It doesn't matter if we don't have access to it. I don't have to be able to communicate with God to know that there is a God. I don't have to be able to communicate with aliens to be interested in the possibility that there are aliens. See, he just like rambles about nonsense nonstop and expects people to just take what he says for granted because he says it in a calm, authoritative way. So naturally, people believe him without question. That's what this is about. Something to consider while we get started. It doesn't matter if we believe in a higher power unless we believe that we have access to it. Bullshit! Complete nonsense! It does not matter if we confess that God has come in the flesh unless we are willing to understand that we are that flesh. I don't know what that even means. What are you talking about? One could even identify as atheist if it is the false gods they are refusing to acknowledge. By viewing these ideas from multiple perspectives, Instead of just our own, we may come to find that it's not who's right that's important, but who's righteous. The it's not who's right that's important, but who's righteous. So it doesn't matter who's correct on this issue. It just matters if you believe. Are you kidding me? This is complete bullshit. All of it. Is it just me? Those who are characterized by justice and act with virtue. Oh, so now he's changing the meaning of the word righteous from somebody who believes something specifically to somebody who acts morally. Okay, it doesn't matter if you're correct. It means if you're, or it matters if you're moral. Is that, is that what he's saying? I think that's what he's saying. All right. We may come to find that it's not who's right that's important, but who's righteous. Those who are characterized by justice and act with virtue. As a collective, we are standing on the shoulders of spiritual and intellectual giants who have brought us to see as far as we can today. Our entire reality is built upon the minds, hearts, and hands of those who came before us. And so- Sure, I suppose that's true, I agree. May it be- By the way, uh, when I hear intellectual giant, I think Isaac Newton. I think Albert Einstein, right? Those people were intellectual giants that built out an understanding of the world that we couldn't, that we hadn't reached at that point at the very least. Maybe we would have eventually, but we weren't there yet. And they clarified that stuff for us. That being said, did you guys know Isaac Newton was a virgin? 
when he died? Uh, I believe, you know what, I should fact check that to be extra sure. Let me just fact check that. He's believed to have died a virgin. Yep. He died at 84 years old. And he was a virgin at 84. A, he never married. Uh, no conclusive evidence he ever had a romantic relationship. I guess he's probably asexual. Gave him more time for thinking, I suppose, right? <laughs> Your mom's a virgin. Ow, that's, that, that one stings, okay? That one was just a step too far. I'll talk shit about my mom till the cows come home. But to say she was a virgin... Ouch. <laughs> oh, I'm just kidding. He was single. Didn't know. Don't know how you'd reasonably verify his virginity. I'm not actually sure either, but he was rigorously puritanical. Um, he was an extremely real. He was a religious extremist, apparently, uh, which I guess. Hang on. There's no evidence he ever had a romantic relationship of any sort. He was very puritanical, and he was never married at all, obviously. If not, if he wasn't married, then he probably, holding his puritanical views, was opposed to sex before marriage, thus most likely never slept with anybody. I think that's kind of the logic, among other little facts uh, about his history. But anyway, that, that seems to be how we know. Sorry for that little uh, detour there. Let's keep listening to these nutcases who have brought us to see as far as we can today. Our entire reality is built upon the minds, hearts, and hands of those who came before us. And so, may it be our intention here today to learn from our past, not from one exclusive perspective, but by weighing all perspectives with that which is pure and true. So they're going to weigh the perspective of Hinduism and Islam as well as Christianity? Okay. Let's do it. It is our hope that from this Christ series, regardless of where we stand in relation to the subject, we may all come a little bit closer to truth and in doing so, come a little bit closer to each other. Okay, well, I guess I'm just gonna wait. I thought there's an intro, but it's really short. This is just a this is just a three wise men riding camels apparently and following the the uh the you know whatever the shining star the the north star whatever to jesus please dude just stop with the music i right, i'm gonna skip past the music uh in editing so yeah there just know that there was terrible music playing through this entire intro all right let's get to the actual video now the apocalypse of jesus interesting okay Chapter 1, Mysteries of the Word of God. The word apocalypse literally means revealing um, or uncovering or explaining. Uh, so the apocalypse of Jesus means the revelation of Jesus or the explanation of Jesus or whatever. Is it just me or is that like really, really conceited to claim to have some special knowledge about Jesus that nobody else has? In the traditional Christian understanding, Jesus is seen as the incarnation and embodiment of God the Father in a mortal body, the very same absolute deity and creator of the universe who spoke to Moses through the burning bush. We might Sure, I suppose that's what the Trinity means. I'd like to start with a question such as, is Jesus God? And in order to answer that question, let's begin with some defining terms so we can get on the same page together. Firstly, the word Christ is a word which means anointed translated from the Hebrew word for Messiah, which did Uh, is that... Wait, wait, what What does Christ mean? I forget. Okay, it does mean anointed one, um, which I, I guess you could... I guess you could translate it to Messiah, but anointed one really means, and this is what Jesus believed about himself, person that has a special purpose that has been given to him by God, ultimately. That's what, that's what it meant. The day has come to designate Jesus as the savior of the world. These words also intrinsically signify heir to the throne of David, linking Jesus' personal genealogy to the greater biblical history and prophecies of the Jewish people. Before Jesus, the term anointed was used in the Jewish Torah to describe kings who would be anointed with oil. It was only- Sure, I suppose. By the way, welcome Kootmaster, yes, from Moshiach. 
anointed. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that uh, that that information on it. I was pretty sure that it 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 was the same. It just you got to fact check every word out of these people's mouths for real. You can't let them get away with a single thing. Only then, after his coming, that the term was applied exclusively to him in Christianity as not just anointed with physical oil, but the divine oil of God, meaning the essential Holy Spirit. As the Messiah, Jesus was spiritually anointed to proclaim and fulfill the good news of salvation to humanity. However, the term Christ is only one of many which have been applied to the person of Jesus. All of these names must be addressed together to paint a picture that can be used as a framework of understanding. Okay, the rest of these are titles, not names. Messiah, Savior, Redeemer. Understanding. Anyone familiar with the story of Jesus might know him as the way, the truth, the life, the Son of God, Son of Man, unblemished Lamb of God, Great Shepherd, Logos, and Light, as well as by many other names, such as Hosanna, Emmanuel, Lord, Redeemer, and so on. Wow, we went... Okay, I don't know what the hell is happening right now, but okay. A little Jesus Christ superstar there, didn't we? I hope that wasn't blasphemy. Blasphemy. The act or offense of speaking sacrilegiously about God or sacred things. Profane talk. Huh, I guess we're good. All of these names seem to set Jesus apart from the other gods of various religious pantheons. That's interesting. So he addressed whether or not it was blasphemous what he said. Huh, okay. Where in other mythologies we see particular aspects of the supreme creative power manifesting itself to guide humanity. Why is Jesus so short? Oh my god. He has Thoth here, or Thoth. He's a little bird creature that was part of Egyptian religious, like Egyptian theology or whatever. Um, I forget, what what was Thoth's, uh, let me look. He's the god of the moon, sacred texts, mathematics, the sciences, magic, messenger and recorder of the deities, master of knowledge, and patron of scribes. He has this really weird belief about Thoth. The, uh, the little eagle man or baboon man depends on um, where he's depicted and when. Anyways, yeah, they have weird, weird beliefs about him. He's just he's just an old deity. That's all from uh, ancient Egyptian times. But he's extremely influential and important in New Age circles, basically. Such as how Thoth is the god of wisdom or Krishna and Buddha were the embodiment of Vishnu, one part of the Trimurti. Jesus is believed to be the supreme ultimate power in totality manifested in the flesh. One way that this is often considered is through the opening of the book of John, which begins, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Yeah, but the book of John was written in around 100 CE, so about 70 years after Jesus died. And the person that wrote it did not actually know Jesus, was not close to him, wasn't friends with him, didn't ever hear him talk, any of that stuff. So there was a, a massive split in Christianity at the time because nobody really had full access to Jesus' teachings. And the person who wrote John was of a split that believed that Jesus was... Uh, was God, basically, that he was God on earth. That was not a common belief at the time. It is common now because the book of John made it into the Bible. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Then, later in the same chapter, John writes, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Again, a lot of these claims were not, were not held by Jesus. In fact, uh, nearly none of them were. This is a theological book, not a historical book. This opening of the book of John may rightly be considered the genesis of the New Testament, since the opening lines are very similar to that of Genesis 1, which also describes how God created all things. No, the genesis of the New Testament? It was written later, and it got all kinds of stuff wrong. What does he mean, the genesis of the New Testament? 
Is he saying, like, it's just theological? Is that what he means? I suppose they're both theological, kind of. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Let's consider that words are instruments in the creation of our reality. One can easily see that without words, our thoughts would remain isolated in the mind, and more complex and intricate patterns of thought. Uh, without words, our thoughts would remain isolated in our mind? What does that mean? I mean, I guess you could have writing, right? Thoughts would remain isolated in the mind, and more complex and intricate patterns of thought would not be possible. Without words, there would be no language, no book. What? What is he talking about? Wait, aren't words part of language? I'm sorry, this is making no sense to me. Books. No I, I'm just not smart enough, right? Is that it? I'm just, I'm too big of a dummy to understand what the hell's going on right now. Is that it? Sharing of ideas. Not only Jesus, but many philosophers, sages, ascended masters, and mystic teachings across history have expressed the absolute power that words have in the creation of our reality, and that through them, we can create or destroy. But in principle, we also have to understand there is a difference between the word and mere words. Whereas we use words to influence and understand our reality through definition, it is said that God used the word to create and define all creation. Um, I, I'm sorry, man. I'm just lost. What the hell is he going on about right now? God used the word to create everything? And the word is not words? So is he saying the word is Jesus? Or... Again, like, that was a bastardized view of Christianity that even Jesus did not hold. So I don't know what he's talking about, or where he thinks he's getting his information from. It is through this understanding that we identify the word as the vibration of creation itself. And wait, wait, vibration of creation? What, what is going on? What is he talking about? Vibration of creation? I'm trying to understand here. So, creation exists because of vibrations or what and this vibration was illuminating by its nature and so while god saying let there be light is certainly a personification of the act of creation so that humans could comprehend it wait oh my god dude like everything he's saying is nonsense none of this makes any sense seriously think about what he's saying let's write this down and really dissect it okay it is through this understanding that we identify the word as- Okay, so creation exists through vibration, right? This vibration is illuminating, okay? As the vibration of creation itself. And this vibration was illuminating by its nature. Uh, okay, vibration is illuminating by its nature. I'm, I'm trying to understand here. And so while God saying let there be light is certainly a personification of the act of creation, so that- Wait, okay, now here's another one. God saying let there be light is a personification? That means God saying that was God identifying that thing as a human being. Personifying, it was giving it personality. Like literal personality. That humans could comprehend it. The essential nature of sound and light being fundamental to the manifestation of reality is paramount. What? It, I don't understand. Well, what's he even talking about? This makes no sense at all. The word word in the Greek tongue is called logos and is a term which is also considered to be the origin of mediation between the visible and invisible within reality. Okay, now let's really think about what's being said here word etymology let's just look up the etymology of it from the germanic word wart um greek word logos the word logos does mean word i suppose but we're an english-speaking country and as such we have germanic roots so actually w-o-r-t is the origin of our word word origin of mediation between the visible and invisible within reality what uh, logos means the origin of mediation between the visible and invisible within reality? I, what does that mean? I don't understand what that even means. The Greek word logos means word, th 
thought, principle, or speech. That's it. That's what it means. That's what logos means. It means, uh, as Lord Falcona says, logos basically means rational discourse or logic. This means nothing. This guy is completely full of it. So although the spoken word cannot be seen with the eyes, the results are observed and felt. So too, the word of God paradoxically exists in both visible and invisible forms. How is that paradoxical? Can't something be partially visible and partially invisible? Like, aren't it, can't it be like, I don't know, just hypothetically speaking, is it possible that one part is a physical manifestation, the other part is a concept? Like, uh, maybe... Just hypothetically, of course, I'm not, I, I don't believe in any of this, but just bear with me for the sake of uh, this hypothetical. Isn't it possible that God exists as a physical being, but his word exists as a concept? Isn't that something that could take place? That's not paradoxical. That's just things existing in different forms. This guy is completely full of shit. It drives me nuts being the vibratory expression of God, which continually brings forth all of reality. Wait, God is vibratory? And an expression of that which cannot be visibly seen in what otherwise might be called the mind of God. Yeah, uh, none of this makes any sense at all. Like, how does he come up with these words? Why is he putting them next to each other? I would love to know what logic he used when writing this script. This means absolutely nothing, right? Is it just me? Talking about God being vibrational or whatever? Like God vibrates? What? Expression of God which continually brings forth all of reality and an expression of that which cannot be visibly seen. In what? Okay, so I guess God continues to bring forth reality because he's God or whatever? All right. Otherwise might be called the mind of God. Words could Wait, be is he saying that we are the mind of God? Like we're in the imagination of God, and if God stopped thinking about us, we just wouldn't exist anymore? Is that what he's saying? I think that's it. This is just bizarre, man. ...be seen as the mediator between the thoughts that we think and the actions that we take. But words can exist in a multitude of ways, including invisibly as thoughts within the mind, audibly spoken, or even written down. So Okay, so I, I guess that there's a concept. So he's talking about thoughts, not words. And what does this have to do with anything? He's talking about Jesus, isn't he? What does this have to do with Jesus being, quote-unquote, the word? Like, what? So as to last longer. Words are not just things that exist when we speak them, but are concepts and structures of thought that allow for the no words are representations of concepts they are a method of describing a concept words are not concepts and words don't exist as thoughts or whatever other thing like that's completely made up do you know that uh some people don't have an inner monologue i think it's like 35 percent or something of the world does not have an inner monologue that thing that speaks to you that voice in your head that tells you things or that says hey, you know what i'm kind of hungry right now i, I want to get up and go get a drink or i want to whatever 35 or something percent of the world does not have that so i don't like words are not a necessary part of the equation they're not a fundamental piece of concepts you don't have to have words to have concepts Babies cannot form out words, but they still have a concept of hunger or key or, uh, I don't know, um, toy or whatever. Just because babies don't have words doesn't mean they don't have concepts. Everything he's saying right now is bullshit. Everything. When we speak them, but our concepts and structures of thought that allow for the translation of energy and ideas from one dimension to another. Okay, what what is this? Uh, words allow for the, hang on. Through. L let's step back, listen again. When we speak them, but our concepts and structures of thought 
that allow for the translation of energy and ideas from one dimension to another. They allow for, oh my God, dude, I have to write this down so I understand what he's saying. Like, it's just word salad, isn't it? That allow for the translation of energy and ideas. Okay, the words allow for the translation of energy and ideas. Okay. From one dimension to another through, through us. From one dimension to another through us. Words allow for the translation of energy and ideas from one dimension to another through us. This is just complete nonsense. Lord Falconis in the chat says he's saying that words create things. Uh, well, that's simply incorrect, good sir. I simply disagree with you. Words do not create things. People create things. Words aren't even concepts of things. Like this, everything that he's saying right now is complete nonsensical garbage. All of it. Is it just me? How the hell does this YouTube channel have uh, 1.35 million subbies on it? It is so ridiculous that this YouTube channel has, like, any views, any subscribers. To understand the Logos better, let us know that the word itself is derivative of the Greek word for logic or reason. Yeah, that, that no, it's not derivative. That's what it means. The word Logos means logic, reason, words, principles. Scripture suggests that it is the thing which pulls order out of chaos at the beginning of time. Wait, which scripture? What's he talking about? Whose scripture says this? Is he talking about the Bible? Does the Bible say something about this? I don't remember this. Scripture suggests that it is the thing which pulls order out of chaos at the beginning of time and sets reality in motion. From this perspective, the word or logos then is the transformative agent which sits at the center between order and chaos. Okay, this makes no sense at all. This is complete garbage. I don't have any clue what he's even talking about. But as I said before, the way they get around the fact that they make no sense at all, when I say they, I'm talking about spirit, science, teal swan, new agers in general. The way they get around the fact that nobody can understand a word out of their mouths is by saying, you're just not smart enough. You just don't understand because you're not intelligent enough to understand. If you had a bigger brain, then you'd get it, dummy. Which may even be associated with articulated truth. Articulated truth for us may express our own ability to articulate that which we know but from a God-level perspective, signifies the great power which sets forth the cosmic laws upon which reality exists in perfect order. Again, like, none, none of these words belong next to each other. And it, it, it baffles me. It's like, how is it that Chris, or I'm sorry, that um, Jordan Peterson, how is it that Jordan Peterson got so famous? His words mean nothing when put next to each other. Nothing. How did he get so famous? Why do people revere what he says when they can't even understand what he says? It's like he uses big words. Um, it's like these people use big words. And when you try to decipher those big words, I suppose you can probably kind of make sense of it a little bit or get something out of it, even if that thing is like completely mundane and uninspiring. But once people actually manage to, like, drag some twisted, bizarre meaning out of what you've said, they feel really smart for doing so. It seems like that's what's happening. We find this concept all the way down to our very DNA, where we find the syntactical structures of genes so logarithmically sound that we can read it like a book. Okay. He says, we find this in our DNA actual words that we can read like a book in our dna no no we don't that's not how dna works it's completely made up but again when you actually put like this is a concept that he's trying to express when you put the words together they're nearly meaningless but when you figure out exactly what he's trying to communicate with that you feel smarter because you understood this big bizarre complex sentence that didn't really mean anything at all or meant something very very mundane 
but you understood it. You're like, I get it now. It all makes sense now. It all clicks into place. That the logo sits at the boundary between the visible and invisible reality may also yield an understanding. Wait, what is he what is he using the word logos to refer to now? Is he talking about because he's using it as like a a proper noun, isn't he? The logos. He's referring to some specific thing. Isn't he? Am I misreading this? What is that specific thing he's talking about? Logarithmically sound that we can read it like a book. That the logo sits at the boundary between the visible and invisible reality may also... I don't know what that means. The, lo the uh, Is he saying logic is visible and invisible simultaneously? The logo sits at the boundary between the visible and invisible reality may also yield an understanding that it is in fact consciousness itself. Uh, okay. I I'm sorry, man. I am trying so hard to make sense of this and I I'm, I'm on the struggle bus over here. So he's saying that consciousness is thought and reality because it sits on the boundary of reality and concept i am so lost dude this is just nonsense all of it right is he saying it? so he's trying to come up with an explanation for how words can be god i guess one may surmise that experiences cannot be had without consciousness as it is the light of awareness which shines upon our reality and um Okay, experiences are consciousness, or is that what he said? Not be had without consciousness. Oh, experiences can't be had without consciousness. Okay, uh, sure, I suppose I can agree with that. One may surmise that experiences cannot be had without consciousness, as it is the light of awareness which shines upon our reality and may... Um, okay, well, that was a really needlessly complex way of saying... You can't experience things unless you have consciousness because consciousness is how you experience things. You could have just said that. Instead, he chose to give us word salad. Be had without consciousness, as it is the light of awareness which shines upon our reality and it all needless garbage makes them real. It is through our consciousness that thoughts become words and the words which we hear are understood in the mind. By that logic, Consciousness seems to be necessary for reality to exist, for without... No. I mean, you can have experiences or not, but it doesn't mean that those things don't exist. Actually, there. so what he's talking about right now seems to me, he's bringing up the age-old question, if you, what's the word? Uh, if a tree falls in the forest and there's nobody around to hear it, doesn't make a sound it's kind of like schrodinger's cat right like uh schrodinger's cat that famous experiment where sure or it's a thought experiment not an actual experiment where schrodinger imagines for a moment that there's a cat in a box you put poison in the box and you put good food in the box too now the cat is either going to eat the poison or eat the the clean food so is the cat alive or dead until you open the box to find out, the cat is both alive and dead in the same moment because you have no clue if it's eaten the poison or not. Um, so once you experience reality, it collapses in on itself and creates the reality around you. So like, does a tree make a noise if it falls in the forest? Schrodinger's uh, thought experiment suggested no it doesn't make a sound if it falls in the forest and there's no one around to hear it and it doesn't even fall until someone's around to see it reality collapses when you arrive at that location and creates the scenario that would have happened otherwise that's actually not true scientists have researched this heavily and found that it does take place whether somebody is there to witness it or not so what he's saying here I guess kind of has some basis in Schrodinger's cat, but is actually just complete nonsense ultimately. Consciousness, there would be no sense of time, space, or orientation wherein the matrix of reality could- Yeah, this is just not true. There would, reality is not dependent on experience. ...be explored. 
it may be said that the Logos is necessary for existence because it gives structure to the absolute chaos of reality and it may be said, but it would be wrong. Makes way for self-awareness and comprehension. This is an amazing idea because it gives consciousness a constitutive role in the creation of reality. All right, let me summarize what he's said so far. This is what he's trying to communicate. The Bible says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God or something to that effect, right? This guy is conflating the word word with concept. And he's saying you can't have reality without conscious experience. And God is consciously experiencing reality, which created us. That's what he's trying to communicate. It's complete nonsense from beginning to end, all of it. Therein, we may even wish to identify God, and thus consciousness, to be the equal sign between the E and the MC squared. Wait, is he saying, okay, E equals MC squared is a calculation for mass converting to energy. Is he saying that energy exists outside of conscious experience? Like, wh what is energy in his mind anyways? This whole thing is bizarre. In Einstein's legendary formula, which demonstrated that all of matter and energy were equal to each other and could even cross the boundaries from one form to the other. Cross the boundaries? No, that's not what that formula calculated. That formula calculated the amount of energy that was produced when you changed it over to matter or away from matter or vice versa, whatever. For example, when you launch a nuclear weapon, when you use an atomic bomb, you're converting mass to energy. That's actually what's happening. E equals MC squared calculates how many joules of energy come out of the equation when you convert a certain number of grams of mass or whatever. That's what that equation is doing. It's not saying energy is equal to mass. Like, what? But we should not jump to conclusions regarding the association of God with consciousness itself. Wow, we shouldn't jump to conclusions, says the guy that just jumped to a bunch of conclusions. Because God is also considered completely indescribable and beyond what we can know. But all of this probably makes sense until we bring the person of Jesus into the equation. As a general concept, the Logos idea makes sense. But then how could Jesus- No, it doesn't. It does not make sense. What the hell are you going on about right now? Be this word of God. How could one person be the embodiment of this vibration of creation? If the He keeps saying vibration of creation as though creation exists through vibrations or something. It's complete nonsense. Vibration of creation permeates into all things. Well, the belief is that the supreme cosmic power would communicate with its creations best through direct contact with them. Whoop, gonna have to blur that one. And by living among them and guiding them personally. Certainly, one might presume that God would use all means available to connect with humans, whether through dreams, strokes- One would think, right? But that's not happening. Books of insight, or our very contemplations of the movements of the heavens. But reality is so intricate. And if it was so- Like, why does he say things like, of the movements of the heavens right whether through dreams strokes of insight or our very contemplations of the movements of the heavens why does he say that why does he say or through our very contemplations of the movement of the heavens? why doesn't he just say or through the way the, st the stars move why does he have to make it way 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 more complicated than it needs to be god can communicate to us through the stars positions he could just say that it wouldn't be true, but he could have said it, at the very least. This guy is so full of himself, it's absurd. I can't stand it. But reality is so intricate. And if it was so easy to really understand everything in existence, surely we would all be enlightened by now. Wouldn't it make sense that the Supreme Spirit would also embody itself within flesh so as to be the most directly relatable in a tangible way? No. It, wouldn't it make sense that God would come down to be a human being if God were real? No. Why would I make that assumption? That makes no sense. And if we too are, as the Bible states, made in the image of God, could it not be then that the coming of Christ 
was a means to show us a way into awakening to our own divine nature, too. I mean, there's so many assumptions built in here. There is assumption after assumption. Was God real? Um, did God send his son down to die for our sins? All this other garbage. It's all assumption after assumption after assumption. And now he's building even more assumptions on top of that. This is insane. Then again, John's words about the word becoming flesh can be interpreted in one other rather significant way. But that's a much larger exposition that we'll have to save to explore later. Nevertheless, if all of the Okay, John's um, words can be interpreted in a different way. Seems like something you should address now, right? This is true. We must consider what Christ meant when he said, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I am doing. He will do even greater things than these. Um, I don't remember that. Did Jesus say that? Jesus was a man who became known not only for his profound wisdom and undying love, but also many miracles that he performed. Could it be that one who is illuminated to such a degree could do the very same as he did? This is often given as a reason for why faith or belief in Jesus is a good thing, even if we lack the material evidence before our eyes. Because if not him, then how us? What? If not him, then how us? What? What do you mean by that? If not him, then how us? What the hell does that even mean? It means nothing. His works, compassion, service, and ultimate sacrifice demonstrated to humanity what it means to come in service to all and embody the innate divine qualities that we are all intrinsically imbued with. Right, because Jesus is literally the first person on planet Earth to ever show care for another person. It just didn't happen before Jesus, ever. So Jesus comes to Earth and shows sympathy for other people. And uh, just like that, charity started and everything changed. Everybody loved everybody else. Totally, totally. And so when Jesus said that those who believe in him will become like him, he is saying that by believing in God's love, we will naturally begin to think, feel, and act according to that love. Compassion, forgiveness, generosity. These are a few of the foundational principles to living and co-creating a life with the intrinsic divinity that is our birthright. Like this is all just nonsensical word salad. The divinity that is our intrinsic birthright, like what the hell are they talking about right now? And does this not sound like a path to salvation? But wait a second, on that note, this last statement probably requires some more attention. Why do we need salvation at all? People say that he died for our sins, but what does that even mean? Yeah, what does that mean? For the record, actually, the, uh, the original Jesus didn't say anything about dying for our sins or whatever. As a matter of fact, Jesus didn't ever expect to die. The original language says that Jesus expected to take over as king of Israel and, uh, you know, reward people that helped him, appoint people certain positions and blah, blah, blah. It wasn't until, like, decades or even centuries later, or hell, even millennia in some cases, when people started forming out completely different interpretations of what Jesus said or what was going to happen or whatever else. The idea that Jesus was going to die for our sins and that was going to, like, bring us salvation, blah, 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 that's not in the Bible under Jesus' words. Jesus never even implied that you had to believe in him to be saved or that he needed to die for your sins. It didn't happen. Jesus didn't say it. That wasn't until Paul, I think, decades later. So yeah, totally made up. Especially since humanity today is, well, still pretty sinful. And actually, what even is sin anyways? Well, stay tuned, because that's where we're gonna go next. Atonement, original sin, all of that stuff was made up after the fact. Jesus did not buy any of that, didn't back any of that up. Well, I guess that's the end. What was it? This is the Word of God Christ series part one. So that was Christ series part one by a New Age nutcase. Let me know what you think about it in the comments. I think the dude is completely full of it from beginning to end. Has no idea what he's talking about but for some reason feels this desperate need to convince people that he does.